Hi, this is Mary Tracy. Northern California Neurotherapy is my clinical practice and eegstrategies.com is my educational entity online. And you are listening to the Neuro Noodle Network podcast. Welcome to Neuro Noodles Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology podcast featuring our neuropsychologist, Dr. Laura Jansen's tech with Santiago Brand, neurofeedback legend, Jake Gunkelman. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. This is an all-star cast more and happy to share their knowledge with you. My name is Pete, and today we have a very special guest, Mary Tracy, Director at Northern California Neurotherapy. She's also the founder of Neurotraining Strategies and a QEG course wizard at Stens University slash Mind Media. Maybe I got some of that right. But before we get to Mary, we got some Patreon love to dish out. Well, of course, Mary Tracy's Neurotraining Strategies offers a higher standard of EEG, QEG education to EEG clinicians, technicians, and neurofeedback practitioners with convenient online BCIA and QEEG certified didactic courses. The sixth annual Super Brain Summit is April 8th at Bradley University featuring Dr. Bruce Wexler. He's a psychiatrist at Yale Medical School. He will discuss neurotherapeutics, how can we regulate the brain with computers? Register now at bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. Please give us five stars and Apple Podcasts. really helps get the word out. If they can't hear us, we can't help them. But for the month of April, Seaburn Fisher will be joining us for oh. every show in the month of April. That is correct. Wow. Mental Health Awareness Month is May, and she's going to come on and give us a little kickstart. And if we all get along, you know, we might continue it. Who knows? That's how we started with Jay, right, Jay? Am I on this show? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to part uh, two of Mary Tracy's talk. Like five volt battery and a couple of wires would basically go through, you know, uh, normal skin impedance without super skin prep and, and basically give you a reasonable current. And they actually did that. Um, uh, they went back to Fort Carson, uh, Colorado, and and uh, uh, I got a phone call in the wee hours of the morning uh, from uh, from the person in the military saying it really works. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he had activated his his approach and turned off his inhibit and um, called me in the wee hours of the morning. I told him, well, it's I, I figured it would work. That's why I told you about it, but you should probably have enough judgment to call during like routine business hours. I might be up all night, but uh, I've got a partner here who does appreciate the phone not ringing at two, three in the morning. So he didn't uh, get the memo, Jay. Well, you know, uh, uh, people know that I don't really sleep much. So they, they yeah. figure it's, it's an easy thing to give me a call, whatever time of day it is. And I may be up and around, but uh, um, I don't always necessarily appreciate phone calls at the wee, wee hours of the morning because of other people at the house here, so. Right, right. All right, so let's move right along here. So this is the power spectra um, from this woman. Yeah. Um, you can see the slowing on the left-hand side. It's, it's actually over the entire uh, left temporal chain. Uh, the problem with the slowing here and here is word finding, working memory, short-term memory. She's got a fast alpha variant in the back of her head, which causes anxiety. That is not a prefrontal cortical feature. Uh, but I did want to demonstrate at least some EEG here that's associated with prefrontal cortex. So um, we also have medial anterior cingulate features of the prefrontal cortex. And I like this diagram because it shows that the cingulate cortex, which is not on the surface, but is underneath the, the surface where uh, we would normally be recording the EEG. We can get recordings of EEG from it, even though it's a little bit deeper than the surface. This has an extremely high baseline metabolic activity at rest. And that's attributed to the spontaneous self-generated mental activity of the, of the default mode network the human resting brain. Um, when goal-directed behavior suddenly lights up, when somebody gets interested in something and they're moving in the direction of goal-directed behavior, the metabolic rate of the medial prefrontal cortex decreases significantly. So there's functional associations between 
the dorsal and the ventral portions, this is the front of the head again, prefrontal cortex, um, with the medial anterior cingulate prefrontal cortex. So the, the former, the dorsal, is associated with complex cognitive operations. So sometimes we can see a slowing in the medial, uh, anterior, medial, uh, prefrontal cortex, and that slowing uh, will be maybe in the theta range, and maybe it'll be pretty high amplitude. We may discover, and I'm gonna show you in the next slide, that the person has a tendency to have obsessive thinking. So this is the cognitive compartment. And sometimes the, um, the EEG in, at FP1 and FP2 shows slowing. And this is the ventral area of the prefrontal of the anterior cingulate. And there's an emotional affective component of the obsession. So here's the Loretta image from a 45 year old female. This is someone else who had obsessive and perseverative affective content. This was one of my uh, patients who was a retired professor of uh, <clears throat> um, neurophysiology and um, knew a lot about the brain, but she had these obsessions with emotional content. Um, she couldn't get to sleep at night. She reported anxiety and mostly fearful rumination. So the, the content of her obsession was fear. And we're seeing that if we draw this line parallel to the body of the corpus callosum in blue here, this is a side view of the head, parasagittal view. We see that most of the content of the slowing in this Loretta image is in the emotional compartment. Jay, I don't know if you want to chime in on that or not. Did we lose Jay? She's uh, take a little break now. Okay. Santiago, Santiago, you want to throw anything in? Santiago? I just want to say, yeah, thanks for the illustrations. Those are beautiful uh, EEGs of what a, a typical problem that I encounter with my clients too. Uh, it's, it's the client who knows they can do better, they can be better, yet something doesn't allow them to go better. And that's where you that's where you have the EG. I think that's where the EG is the, the most one of the most powerful tools we can have because we can show them, look, this is not a reflection of who you really are. It's just a reflection of what's happened to you at the moment. And if we train with the right protocols, with the right approach, with the right intervention, we can stabilize your brain to work better again and get you to be the person you know you can be. Um, and I sit time and again, I just recently did a, a, an EEG of a, a young kid who got into trouble at school and same finding, all this long in the prefrontal cortex. Kid sat through the EEG, he was very cooperative, very well-mannered kid. He sat through it, never gave me any trouble, but at some point he started getting fidgety. And you, know, you see all this data or the FP1, FP2, uh, F7, F8, and there you have it. I mean, he has no ability to, to control his impulses and he's doing very well academically, but he just gets in trouble because he doesn't contemplate the consequences of his actions. So this is very important because then you can explain to these very concerned parents that, you know, that, that this is not out of uh, volition. You know, this is not willful behavior all the time and that we have a brain that we need to stabilize, that this is not a bad kid, that this is not a bad person. So th there's great value in the images. And um, I think that this just really gets the point across. In my experience, I've had parents, when, when I'm doing EG assessments and I'm providing the feedback, you know, there's parents who cry out of concern. We train for X amount of sessions, the kid person gets better, and then you get tears of joy. And I think that's one of the, you know, the, the high points of, our, of the work that we do. And it's good that we have the tools available for that. It's very satisfying. And I don't know about you, Santiago, but oftentimes um, when I do a 19 lead EEG assessment and I give the person the results, they start crying. Cause it's like the first thing they say is, so I'm not crazy. I really, I mean, this, I really have this. You can really see this in my brain. It's like, yeah, it's, 
you know, we don't diagnose with this stuff, but it correlates right. very closely with your presenting symptoms. And a lot of times yeah. I'll get tears at that point. Yeah, I've seen very powerful reactions from people you wouldn't expect. You know, teenagers usually when they come see me, they come very quiet. They don't say hi. They reluctantly sit on that chair because they're thinking they're going to see just one more shrink who's going to try to talk to them about the troubles. And so I, I give them play by play. I explain to them what the cap is, what I'm gelling. I show them the images. By the end of the session, most teenagers will turn to their parents and go, I want to come here. This I want to do. Because they, they, they get to see their brain. And, and, they, and some of them turn to their parents and say, see, I told you, I'm not making this up. I'm not crazy. <laughs> and the parents go, oh, okay, now we get it. So I, I think in terms of the, the human impact, this is a very powerful tool to have. Absolutely, Santiago. And I have a similar experience. I know I need to move along here, but if I have a kid who's like just fidgeting and he's looking out the window, mostly he, sometimes she, and just non-cooperative, and I try to have a talk and nothing happens, and they're saying, mom, because mom's in the waiting room, mom, come and get me, this isn't working. I usually have a talk with the parents and I say, you know what, I don't wanna put this kid through hell if he doesn't wanna be here, so I would suggest you bring him back. You know, maybe in six months, maybe in a year, I just don't wanna turn him off to the possibility that his brain function could be optimized with neural feedback just because at this point in time, um, you know, he's so oppositional defiant. So um, I've had kids come back in six months, eight months, a year. And it's like, you know what? I've been thinking, I want more friends. I want to do better in school. I want to compete with my peers. And they come back. So uh, yeah, I'm, I, I need to move along here, but... Uh, Mary, I got you as long as you want. Santiago, Jay, if you got to split, just split. And Mary, you let me know when you got to go, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. But I'm here for the long haul. Okay. Whatever you got. Okay. okay. So it's funny when people have been told it's all in your head, uh, and they, you know, it's, it's like You're to right. dismiss it. Uh, when you finally show them that there is something in their head, they're happy to see that there's actually something real uh, that can be dealt with, as opposed to being dismissed. There's something, it's just all in your head, like it's an imaginary uh, uh, disability of some sort. So I, I've also experienced the, you know, people uh, tearful about uh, the, the good news that there's actually pathology of some sort. And I, I've always thought that's a little odd when you show them that there's a, you know, something seriously wrong with their brain uh, that, that they end up being glad to see it. Um, uh, the, you know, there's actually something there that's not all in their head. I think we have to also consider that as neurofeedback practitioners and the QEG analysts, we tend to get the train wrecks. We tend to get the people who have tried everything yeah. forever with their kids. Even if their kids are five or six years old, they've been on every single psychotropic medication, heavy duty, nothing's worked. And no one has been able to satisfy them. No one's been able to give them any hope or change anything in their lives for the better. And so that part of it makes me understand why, why they cry when it's like, wow, we actually found something and we can do something about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move along here. So a little bit on uh, prefrontal cortex development during adolescence. Um, for many years, it was thought that brain development was completed by, you know, early teenage years, maybe 18 or so when, when we used to go to college. Now it's like 25 sometimes. But the MRI studies um, have, that, that have mapped the brain from early childhood to adulthood have found data that's contrary to that. So it now appears that the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to mature. I'm gonna show you some graphics on that. And some say it's not until the third decade of life. I was having this conversation with Jay in a consulting session the other day, and he thinks it's more like sometime in the second decade of life. Um, but regardless of when it actually happens, I think we all have the experience that um, adolescents might use poor judgment and might engage in risky behavior for quite some time before they decide to settle down and actually apply themselves to 
something goal directed that's going to benefit them in their lives, not just something that's going to uh, either please their parents or piss their parents off. So this is a really interesting graph that shows uh, the maturation of the brain as a function of age. And we all know uh, that the limbic system, which regulates emotion, uh, develops much, much faster uh, than the prefrontal cortex. So what do we have? We've got Jay's limbic system banditos here operating from early childhood uh, up into maybe second, third dec decade of life, not having completed, um, actually the, the limbic system is, is already laid down and completed, but then we have the prefrontal cortex not having completed its trajectory of development. Now we all know that children are emotional decision makers. Um, if they're very young, they haven't had the uh, ontological development of the prefrontal cortex that would help them to contain and manage and control and regulate their um, emotional urges could happen. And a part of what we do when we're working with adolescents is try to help the brain to move from an emotionally based decision making posture to a rationally based decision making posture. And of course, that takes a whole village in order to help that to happen. Uh, we need a, a whole context of, of parenting and education and that type of thing. So this graph furnishes an explanation of uh, various reactions and behavior patterns that are typical of adolescents. So pronounced risk-taking behavior with respect to alcohol and drug consumption, automobile driving, sexual contacts, increased incidence of emotional disorders and affective disease, we definitely see that, and ease with which interpersonal conflicts can lead to physical violence. So here we have a, um, a, a series of brains um, starting from a five-year-old to a 20-year-old brain. And the red and yellow parts of the brain are the less fully mature parts of the brain. And the blue and purple uh, indicate a brain that's fully matured. So this is a brain that's an emotionally driven brain that doesn't have the flexibility, resilience, and control to regulate uh, their behavior in goal-directed ways. In the preteen, we see that uh, the development is, is moving from the back towards the front of the head, but we, you know, we have some resolution of the immature areas in the right frontal cortex, but not completely. And then in the teen brain, we still don't have uh, a so-called blue-purple brain yet here. Um, in, the, in the teen brain, a funny thing happens on the way to adulthood, which is that um, neurons start to actually get pruned back in the frontal cortex and the childhood brain starts to become ontologically sculpted into a brain that's capable of understanding what consequences are, of being able to think rationally, of being able to do theoretical thinking. And so we see that this brain is more fully matured. And here's a time lapse of that. So you see that the brain is immature and then as it's maturing, at this right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is basically responsible for regulating emotion. Containing and managing emotional urges is the very last thing to develop. So, so again, um, this really puts kids at risk um, for lots of behaviors that may have uh, very unfortunate consequences for them. So here's the triad of neurodevelopmental features that underlies adolescent risk-taking. Hey, let's take a break in the action to tell you about the Super Brain Summit at Bradley University. You can check it out online at bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. It's happening this April 8th. Featured speaker will be Dr. Bruce Wexler, an international expert on digital neurotherapeutics, and he's a psychiatrist at Yale School of Medicine. Hey, visit the Brain Cave, walk through the brain using Oculus Quest. How cool. Check it out April 8th, bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit.
there's a propensity uh, during adolescence for reward and novelty seeking in the face of uncertainty. And um, this propensity uh, happens as a result of this triad of neural system activity that's mostly reverberating, a strong reward system in the nucleus accumbens, a weak harm avoidant system, which is the amygdala, which uh, normally is thought to regulate fear and anger, and an inefficient supervisory system, that's the medial ventral prefrontal cortex. So once again, we've got the limbic system banditos, which are going for the reward uh, at any cost that cannot be maintained, controlled, and regulated in an adult fashion in order to think about, you know, what is my behavior going to do in terms of my risks in the future and in terms of whether I'm going to succeed in, in the future or not. So let's move on to normal aging. Um, we've got only a few slides left here. Um, the dorsal, I mean, the prefrontal cortex, as we've seen, is the last part of the brain to mature. It's also, unfortunately, the first part of the brain that undergoes aging during a normal um, developmental curve. So what we're looking at here is different types of, of symptoms that we might see that are called mild behavioral impairment. We also have mild cognitive impairment. And the mild behavioral impairment symptoms that we see in an aging population above age 60 is sleep disorders, agitation, irritability, uh, disinhibition, um, you know, telling off-colored jokes in, uh, in inappropriate social circumstances, OCD-like behaviors, perseveration, emotional liability, indifference, lack of empathy, uh, loss of social tact. And I love this, this photographic montage because I think you could probably match every single one of these descriptors. This guy's a really good actor. So we think sometimes of older people. It, it looks like the uh, ampl amplifier buying process. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, wow, I should send this on to Erwin at Line Media. Maybe he could relate, huh? At least, at least it would help him to figure it out. Um, anyway, we think of older people as cantankerous, uh, grumpy, peevish, sulky, bad-tempered, crotchety. Um, that's because of this mild uh, behavioral impairment. I wanna show you um, these MRI images, I'm, I'm sorry, CT images, because um, we have something called involutional brain changes with aging. It's the shrinkage of the cortex with age that highlights these larger spaces between the cortical sulci and gyri. So um, the folds or the bumps on the surface of the brain, if you look at a brain in three dimensions, those are the gyri and they start to shrink back and the sulci are these little grooves. And you can see how the grooves are getting bigger. They're getting darker. There's more black here than there is here. And you also see this huge, looks like almost a vacuum opening up in the frontal lobes. This is the degeneration of the prefrontal cortex just in normal aging. And if we and look at And the size this, of the ventricles as well. And the size of the ventricles, yeah. good point. Yeah, uh, because this is all shrinking here. The ventricles are in, that carry the cerebral spinal fluid are enlarging, right, Jay? Correct. Uh, as the cortex shrinks, it gives more space, and uh, uh, space will be occupied. So uh, the fluid-filled cavities that you see inside the brain end up expanding because there's nothing to keep them from expanding, and unfortunately, uh, the the person on the far right has substantial cortical atrophy, uh, frontally, temporally, uh, subcortical structures are lost. Um, uh, the the full-blown uh, Alzheimer's disease is a, a, a tragic dementia, but it's, it's only one of many kinds of dementia that you can end up having. Multi-infarct dementia, uh, bin swangers. I mean, there's 
uh, Korsakoff syndrome from alcoholism. There's so many kinds of, of dementia. The EEG is actually quite useful in differentiating the kinds of dementias, but it's underutilized clinically for that purpose, unfortunately. Well, thank you for saying that because I think I may have referred to this as normal. This is normal. This is mild cognitive impairment stage, and this is Alzheimer's disease. And what we're gonna see in just a minute is that mild cognitive impairment in aging does not necessarily always result in Alzheimer's disease. A lot of mild cognitive impairment is just senility. It's just a, a function of the aging process. So this was a very interesting study um, that was uh, done by authors who quantified brain MRIs from more than 2,200 male and female participants in the Framingham Heart Study. And they ranged in age from 34 to 97 years. And this graph shows that the frontal lobe volume showed the greatest decline with age, approximately 12% over the age range studied. Whereas, so that's the frontal lobe, look at the mass decreasing, and this is uh, with aging. And that compared to the temporal lobes, the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. And of course, um, men had much more uh, loss um, in the pre prefrontal cortex. Uh, than women did. And I'm going to let you guys comment on that. I'm not even going to touch that. I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody wants to comment on that. If you look at the Korean database, which was the first database to separate males and females, one of the dramatic changes that you see between the two sexes is from 45 years old on up. Females have an increase in fast activity in the brain. Males go almost electrically silent in the high frequencies. Um, uh, the, the, there, there's a dramatic difference in the uh, mature male and mature female brain. You can't just lump together the data sets and expect them to represent normal. Uh, you, you've got to differentiate. And uh, um, it's, it's not just tropic changes, a atrophy, basically. Tropic changes are never better usually. <laughs> you know, when they, they refer to tropic changes, they're talking about atrophy, not not beneficial changes. And right. um, uh, the, the loss of the frontal content ends up being uh, seen in Pick's disease as a specific kind of pathology. Uh, frontotemporal dementia or Pick's disease ends up being, uh, you know, that they usually come in complaining of grandpa having gotten, you know, uh, nasty and crazy. They get off my lawn sort of a thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, and nobody complains if grandpa has gotten nice, you know, but the uh, personality changes for the, for the negative uh, disinhibition with a frontal lobe loss are really dramatic in Pick's disease. Personality change, you know, um, second childhood. Uh, there, there's all sorts of terms that kind of go along with Pick's disease loss of frontal function, uh, but other uh, dementias also lose frontally, uh, uh, frontotemporal, uh, changes with vascular uh, uh, dementias are also kind of where you expect it. Uh, and those are, uh, those are really pathological changes. This is, you know, these uh, 2,200 yeah. uh, male and female participants were normal. Uh, they, they were showing healthy brain aging. So, um, and St disease. statistical average brain aging, you yes. know, that uh, take the pathological stuff out this is the statistical normal degradation right. that you can expect. There are some people that don't have this kind of degradation. Not everybody ends up having this, uh, but it's the statistically normal you know, thing, which in a database, you get the norms and this is what the norm is expected. But there are some people that have superior performance, not just the norm and uh, maintaining function at old age is something that can happen. Um, you'll, you'll find that there, I, I've recorded people over a hundred years old that had 10 Hertz or better for alpha and, and they were sharp as a tack, you know, um, uh, very, very, uh, uh, mentally uh, engaged and, and intact. Uh, I've seen 35, 40 year olds uh, whose brains were looking like I expected the seniors to look, you know, slow to alpha, uh, frontal tropic changes. So, um, not, everybody ends up being the average of elderly. There's some superior elderly folks as well. And um, uh, it, 
uh, tends to sort of run in families. There's some families that have, you know, uh, uh, loss of cognitive function expected in their 40s and 50s. Uh, some families, their their elderly are still quite intact over 80 years old. You know, right. um, <clears throat> and we're going to see some other changes here in just a minute yeah. that might inform us about um, why some people have less uh, loss of prefrontal cortical mass than yeah. others as they age. I have Sorry, an aunt. Jay, I, who, I have an I have an aunt who just turned one hundred, <laughs> and uh, the picture of her at one hundred years old. Uh, if you ask somebody how old she looks, she looks. People would say she looks my age, you know, and she's a generation older than I am. Uh, well, that's because you look one hundred and twenty, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I'm joking. You uh, look like a spring chicken, man. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like the the chicken with parts missing maybe you know uh, <laughs> you do have some parts missing that's i true. know i know uh, quite a few actually so <laughs> i even had some put, i even had some put back on you know I, I cut those four fingers off and had them stuck back on so yeah. um you know parts <laughs> missing like some chicken is the truth for me you know yeah <laughs> sorry jay that's okay. You're so easy to tease and you're such a good sport. I, I don't want to disrespect you. I just want the uh, uh, audience if, to know that I'm not, I'm not doing this out of disrespect. If, if, you didn't tease I, me, if you didn't tease me, I'd have to tease myself, you know, okay. that just gets awkward. So. All right. So no self teasing. Okay, here we go. Welcome to part two. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last slide. Second to last slide. I'll keep going. This is the, you just bought okay. me a week. This is awesome. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> this is uh, Yasmin Netik Simmons, who uh, the study comes out of UC Davis and I recently found her on, um, I don't know, um, one of those services where you find people. And uh, she said, I'd love to talk with you about the paper, but I just had a baby. <laughs> so um, I didn't have a conversation with her, but this uh, was a very interesting study that was an imaging study that was part of the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. It, um, it's currently funded by the National Institute of Aging at the NIH, but in 2004, they got a grant of $27 million from 20 large companies who basically were investing in the development of biomarkers as outcome variables and clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. So now many universities are benefiting from these uh, large grants. Particular for, particularly for neuroimaging and clinical biochemistry. So small subject group, but what they did was they were comparing cognitive decline and they were looking at Alzheimer's markers and they were doing psych testing for cognitive variables for um, frequently uh, performed activities of daily life, that type of thing. And they had two normal control groups and these groups were highly educated. Between them, they had an average of 16 years of education and they were healthy groups. Um, they excluded from the normal control groups any significant neurological disease. Um, for the Alzheimer's group, obviously they had to have Alzheimer's markers. Um, they in included stroke or any, if there was any stroke, systemic disease, unstable medical condition, the, they were not allowed, these people were not allowed to be in the normal control group. And they, again, they didn't show any Alzheimer's uh, markers. So they, they, they are still measuring the longitudinal performance. Uh, this was done in 2013. So these people are part of a longitudinal study that goes on. So they, they, they took the normal one and the normal two group, split them into two groups on the basis of cardiovascular disease factors. And the uh, cardiovascular disease uh, risk factor group had higher uh, body mass index. They were marginally significantly higher on fasting glucose and triglyceride levels. That was the only difference between group one and group two. They all had the same scores on the neuropsych testing, the co cognitive testing, the frequent activities of daily life measurements, and a number of other things. It was a, a pretty comprehensive test. 
So these three factors is some are, they, they they form a constellation known as metabolic syndrome, uh, which sometimes manifests as kind of the pear-shaped body, like a lot of uh, fat accumulation around the midsection, not so much in the upper body or the lower body. And uh, previous studies had shown that that these risk factors were associated with cognitive decline and incident, incident dementia. So um, what happened was that the cognitive differences between normal one and normal two showed significantly poorer performance for normal two over time. Like they had um, a greater decline in memory functions and ability to perform daily tasks like balance checkbook, repair meals, pay their bills, find their way around. Uh, their neighborhood, but these people did not have Alzheimer's, no markers whatsoever. And so one of the things we learned from this study in terms of normal aging and normal, I wouldn't say normal, but mild cognitive impairment is that cerebral atrophy is associated with multiple vascular risks. And it's common among cognitively normal individuals. So they form a distinct, distinct subgroup with significantly increased cognitive decline. So there's, there's probably more than one pathway to Alzheimer's disease because we don't really know where these people are going in the future on the longitudinal tests. Already after I think it was five years, the normal group with the cardiovascular risk factors showed significantly poorer performance on all of the tests. They were they were closer to what the Alzheimer's group was showing actually in terms of testing. So the prospect of cognitive decline with advancing age is a tangible threat that should encourage more middle-aged and older people to adopt healthier lifestyles. Now, what I can't say because the longitudinal study hasn't gone on long enough is if these factors are the precursor to what's called vascular dementia. And Jay, you probably know much more about this than I do. You might wanna comment on that. But so far, it doesn't look like, um, it, it, at, at where they are right now, it appears that they are not heading towards dementia, but they are experiencing declines in cognitive impairment and behavioral impairment as a function of the metabolic syndrome. Jay? And if you have high triglycerides and uh, high, high body fat, um, uh, high blood pressure, these things end up changing the brain's uh, vasculature over time. Uh, the, the left hemisphere is more prone to vascular change than the right hemisphere is. And we generally expect to start to see these changes essentially due to lifestyle uh, uh, start to add up. Um, these people are likely not going to be Alzheimer's disease, but they'll probably have uh, a, a progressive decline in function because of microvascular changes. Um, uh, we, we can see the complaints as they start to have word finding and verbal fluency. You, you typically see left frontotemporal changes. As subtle vascular changes happen, the EG has findings. They're nonspecific, so they're very often ignored by traditional interpretation. But mid-temporal sharp slow transients were identified as a nonspecific finding. Ernst Niedermeyer did a nice study over 200 patients. They drilled down to find out with the mid-temporal sharp slow transients, what do they see? And mid-temporal sharp slow transients were identified about 80 plus percent of them were vascular issues migraine, uh, post-traumatic ischemia, uh, uh, anomalies of vasculature like AVMs, arteriovenous malformations or, or aneurysms, but there was a vascular source for the mid-temporal sharp slow and over 80% of them. Uh, the other 20%, the mid-temporal sharp slow transients were due to irritative or epileptogenic type changes. Um, the overweight changes are gonna be the vascular variety uh, vascular change with aging uh, is associated with these uh, high triglycerides um, and un unfortunately uh, lifestyle choices end up taking time to end up uh, uh, making their ultimate impact. Uh, but uh, the, 
their ultimate impact is pretty well assured if you don't end up changing your lifestyle. Right. So there is a, a differential here between vascular dementia and between what we might call a cardiovascular decline um, in cognitive impairment. So the only other thing I want to say here is that, remember we talked about um, the two different types of attention, the exclusive, exclusive uh, inclusionary and exclusionary attention, that as we age, um, we begin to have problems with that. We begin to get more easily distracted by things because the filtering mechanisms in the frontal orbital area are not working properly. We have a more difficult time focusing and concentrating on a task at hand because of dorsolateral prefrontal cortical um, problems with aging uh, as the brain tends to slow down. And I can tell you uh, from my own personal testament that if you do not have ADD by age 60, you'll probably have it afterwards. Just, just as a function of normal deterioration of the brain because it so specifically affects the prefrontal cortex, which is so specifically devoted to our ability to accomplish things in the world and in an efficient way. It just becomes incredibly inefficient and time consuming. And you find yourself standing in front of the refrigerator for like three minutes, like I know I came here to get something. I'm not exactly sure what that was. So last slide, Pete, you're gonna be happy to see this. We are oh. done, guys. Mary Tracy, thank you so much for coming on. We thank you all for listening to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology Podcast. We'd like to thank our Patreon business supporters and our show sponsors. Mary Tracy's Neuro Training Strategies offers a higher standard of EEG, QEG education to EEG clinicians, technicians, and neurofeedback practitioners with convenient online BCIA and QEG certified didactic courses. Register now at eegstrategies.com slash course hyphen neuro. Check out the 6th Annual Super Brain Summit this April 8th at Bradley University featuring Dr. Bruce Wexler, psychiatrist at Yale Medical School. We'll discuss neurotherapeutics and how we can regulate the brain with computers. Register at bradley.edu slash superbrainsummit. If you have an idea for a topic or a guest, Email Pete at neuronoodle.com or leave a voicemail in the podcast link below. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And hey, if you really, really, really like us, you can always buy us a coffee on Patreon slash Neuronoodle. We love our Patreon peeps, don't we, Jay? Absolutely, Pete. They get great coverage on this show, don't they? Oh, my, just ask Mary. Cue the I'm music. getting it. I'm getting it. Thank you. you feel, I love it. You're feeling the love. Well, I'm feeling we'll the love, out. baby. We don't